I'm here with Alex Bowen, Booker extraordinaire, New Orleans music town legend, I would even say. Oh, wow. Now. Yeah, wow. man. How are you? We're in the between jazz fests right now. I'm great. I'm tired. Always. Uh, yeah, you know, the feet are hurting. Weekend one was a marathon, but we made it. Um, everything was great. Weather, um, you know, minus the weather on Saturday overall, everything was phenomenal. You said feet hurting. Do you do you an insole guy? Do you use anything to try? Because uh, you're on your feet a lot. What people don't understand is like, being in the industry, you are on your feet constantly. It's almost like service industry on steroids to a certain degree. hundred percent. You know, I, uh, I, I've got this weird formula where I won't wear the same shoes two days in a row. I in, like that. In order to give my feet a break, but I do have a couple pairs of Hoka's. I throw in a couple pairs of That's Air Force guy. Ones. So, you know, it's just bouncing in between. But if I'm doing an actual proper festival in the fairgrounds, it's Hoka's all day. Hoka, if you're listening to this, sponsor me, Alex. Now. I've exclusively been running in Hoka's for five years. I can't wear anything else. And it's become my Jazz Fest dad fit. It's, it's just a throw them on. The Whole Foods crowd kind of took it over because they're not like exceptionally cool looking, but they're everywhere now. It's like walking on a Tempur-Pedic mattress. Yeah. It's the best thing ever. Once I saw like the nurses and all them were on too, too, it was like, all right, they're, they know what they're doing. 100%. But, but I want to talk about how you got into the industry, man. I want to hear right. from your start to get to now. I want to hear the whole story and just explain to people where you came from, where you're going, and, and how you keep going, essentially navigating this town and this industry through sobriety, which I think is fantastic and admirable. Yeah, so um, let's see. I went to my first concert in third grade. Shout out Uncle George Fabalor. Appreciate you. Um, <laughs> you know. I, he brought me and my sister to a Boys to Men Brandy concert as Amazing. a third grader, took us backstage and you know, everyone's backstage excited to meet the Boys to Men guys. And I'm yeah. literally just tugging at George's arm saying, how do I make money doing this as a third grader? Very so, industrious. Yeah, even at yeah, that age. At, at thir as a third grader. Um, so, you know, that, that was kind of my first look into what the live, a live concert was. Uh -huh. And, uh, I just fell in love with it. And, you know, I, Next, the, the following year, I went to my first rock show. It was uh, Bush, Goo Goo Dolls, and No Doubt. Nice. That's yeah. a hell of a bill, it was, man. It, 1997, dude. It, yeah. was, it was epic. And then uh, the next year, my uncle took me to see Smashing Pumpkins and Garbage on the Infinite and Me or Melancholy and Infinite Sadness tour. You're talking about like legendary, a legendary era of rock. Yeah. And, and then later that year, he took me to see Metallica. And that's when it really, for me, clicked. It was on the Reload tour. And when they played uh, Fuel... Okay. And, the, and, yeah, the, and the, yeah, yeah. The, the fire came up, all the pyro. That, that was, was it right when me. they cut their hair, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, but that was when I was like, I have to do this. As soon as you the pyro the came up, it was just like, okay, I, this is it. This yeah. is it for me. And now you have people potentially trying to advance pyro. Which is where you're like, fuck that, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we did just have pyro uh, at, at Shine Down in Baton Rouge at the arena last weekend. That was, yeah. that was pretty cool. But yeah, it's funny when people want to come into a club and it's just like, no. <laughs> oh, no, man. It's like, for those of you who have never been close to pyrotechnics, I couldn't imagine being on stage in dealing with that. Cause like we saw a lamb of God at this festival, summer fest in Milwaukee. And we were probably like 50 yards back you feel the heat. and we were feeling the heat. But I realized every three or four songs, they took like a minute break and played some tracks and like some of the guys changed shirts and shit, but it's for the love of the music. Yeah. So it's all about the show, man. You know that. But anyway, so you go from how, first I want to ask you, how did your, is your uncle in the industry? He was, yeah. Connections? He used to. He was like, I, I guess, the Beaver Productions guy for Lafayette okay. in the uh, in the nineties. Cool, man. It, it's nice to at a young age be able to see backstage and behind because a lot of people they have no idea what it's really back there. But now it's mostly a bunch of people looking at their phones. Like, yeah, it's not. It's not the seventies or eighties heyday. Yeah. of what it used to be. But anyway, so your uncle got you. The put the bug in your ear. Yep. And you're going to see these incredible shows for a long time. And then let's say you, you start getting into high school in that age and what happens? Lots of three eleven shows. Of you know course, that. Yeah. Three eleven. And him have seen a ton of three eleven shows. Um Yeah, and, and you know, I, I just always loved going to shows. It was always a passion of mine. Um and you know, as far as for getting into the actual uh industry of it, I went to an audio engineering school in Austin in two thousand eight or nine somewhere St. In, Edwards oh uh, no 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 it was called Media Tech Institute it was okay. a, a, two, a year long program and I got an audio engineering degree I did not know that yeah and you know I, the the engineering aspect of it 
wasn't really for me. Like I, you know, it was cool, but like I, I didn't want to be in a studio. Uh -huh. And um, when they had did a, a three month course on the business side of it, is where I really, you know, started to take yeah, interest. You're passionate about that. Yeah. And so me and a couple buddies actually bought a bar in Baton Rouge um, at the right before the EDM kind of explosion happened, and uh, started throwing some EDM shows out there. And you know, as a 25 year old. If you think owning a bar would be the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> At 25, it sounds cool. Yeah. But it's a hard game. Yeah. In any I, town. And then you want to say, if you want to do music with it too. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it definitely we got in over our heads. And uh, I was fortunate to be able to get out of it in nine months and come to New Orleans. And uh, Ron Richard from Simple Play. Shout out, Ron. Yeah. We uh, teamed up and started throwing shows. Mm -hmm. And then um, our other buddy, Nigel Rafferty. Who, of course, yeah. Know, Nigel, our, his... our kids go to the same daycare. Okay. So I see him every now and yeah, then. Yeah, we, um, you know, he, he ended up coming to join us and we started throwing shows around town. Like we did, uh, I think, Galactic Halloween, like 2011 at the Howlin' Wolf. Um, just promoting. Yeah, just promoting, yeah. being an independent promoter and uh, learning that side of it. And we did a... Uh, a Zed's Dead show in Baton Rouge at the Varsity Theater, and it sold out. And uh, a couple months later, their in-house talent buyer left to open up the new casino that opened up out there. So that position okay. became available. And um, I ended up developing a relationship with the GM, and he saw I was a young guy. I didn't get loaded or anything while at work or party. I was all about the business, and he took a shot on me. And, you know, it kind of just snowballed from that point. Amazing, man. I want to talk about... The bar. We'll start off with okay. that. So you're, what was the name of the bar? Uh, it was called The House in Tigerland. In Tigerland. For those of you not aware, Tigerland is like the ground zero for LSU's partying, essentially. And we've gone through, I'm trying to think, we did Chelsea's, Bogey's. <sighs> was there ever a Spanish moon? There was a Spanish in moon. In Baton Rouge. Yeah, that's, that's where the moon I was. Think, yeah, okay. There, I'm trying to think. We've all the way up until the varsity. Yeah. And there's a lot of good music that will come through there just because of the college. But then you got to deal with the college kids. So what are some of the growing pains you experience as, as a young bar owner in the industry there? Uh, well, so having never have served a drink in my life, um, yeah, you had to learn how to serve drinks. Well, yeah, <laughs> learn how to serve drinks, you know, realize there's an actual business behind it. And it's not just partying every night, yeah. you know, which was uh, a, a hard reality to face of like, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, luckily, the guys I partnered with both had bar experience and um, were, you know, saw that I wasn't happy with it. I mean, my whole goal was I was going to book music. And mm -hmm. because of the way things played out, they're like, hey, you need to run this. We're busy. Yeah, you need projects. to be an owner and do what's. Yeah, and I'm like, done. I have no idea how to do this. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? They're like, just, you know, ha have drinks and count money. And I'm like, oh, okay, I, I can do that. Yeah, figure that out. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it, it just really wasn't for me. And, um, you know, it, 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 in turn, there was actually a lot of responsibility involved. Like, you have to make sure that, you know, Underage kids aren't drinking because they have the ATC across the street with binoculars oh, yeah. looking at wristbands. So. All that, the proper licensing. Yeah, it was just a responsible very, very, vendors permits. Very, all very the fun stressful, stuff. stressful time that you know when I when I had the opportunity to <clears throat> get out and focus on music, which was where the passion was. I, I jumped. And now you said around 2011 is when you started promoting here. Yep. In a post Katrina world, people don't know this now. Like around then, there were not a ton of venues or music industry anything really going on in town you had the lakefront and tipitina's and we we didn't have the fillmore we didn't have the sanger we didn't have the joy we didn't have the civic and a lot of those guys who were promoting shows now are now in the higher position gigs <clears throat> in town which is kind of awesome yeah. to see it build from the bottom can you explain what that was like so for us, uh, you know, we, we got into it, got into it. Um, Ron had a connection with um, Rio at One Eye Jazz. Of course. Rest yeah. in peace. Legend. 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 And, um, you know, we started doing shows at One Eye Jacks. Um, and from that point, just, you know, got into doing some stuff on Frenchman Street at, uh, at Maison and at Dragon's Den. 
And then our, our biggest show was that, that Zed's Dead thing we did in Baton Rouge. And then this when was the, when Zed was like just on his come up. Yeah, they were just starting to come Before, up. Before, like now they headline festivals all over the world, but yeah. they're still there coming up. Yeah. There. And uh, it was like a Tuesday night in Baton Rouge. And, you know, that, that was our first like eye opening of like, whoa. Like, yeah. it's, you know, probably felt great. Oh, it was like, incredible. Shit, we, yeah. We, we had, had an after party, at a, after yeah. party with the guys at a frat house. Like, yeah, it was a whole. Yeah. The yeah. whole thing. And, um, you know, th- then in w- once we we got that Galactic show uh, on Halloween, like for us, like that was the pinnacle of the mm-hmm. time. Like, oh, my God, we got a go- band in town. Biggest yeah. band in town. One of the biggest nights of the year. And, um, you know, it, it, it was awesome. And, you know, that that was at uh, the Howling Wolf. We, we did some stuff. Howie also kind of opened his doors and saw that we were young and hungry mm-hmm. and uh, let us go in there. And then... Um, we got into House of Blues. We we sat down with Sonny Schneido, also legend. Yeah, another um, legend in town. Him and Austin Briggs kind of let us go in there and, you know, kind of cut our teeth in the parish. And, you know, to us, like, we were on the top of the world, you know. Yeah. We're, we're going into House of Blues. We're going into One-Eyed Jacks. We're yeah. going into Frenchman Street. Like, that was – we all thought that this was the pinnacle. But House of Blues, that was your first time dealing with, like, Big time with Live Nation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Big time. Because, like, all the other venues are were independent. As yeah. Amazing as Jax is, you know, Jax's was RIP, that iteration of it, the coolest room in town. 100%. Amazing, best sounding room. And Frenchman Street is incredible, too, but this is all independently owned venues. Yeah. Where the House of Blues, you're starting to deal with Live Nation. Starting to deal with Live Nation and, and realizing, you know, the, the magnitude of like a, an operation at that scale where, yeah. you know, you need to talk to this person for this, this person for that. This is your music hall manager. You know, these are your talent buyers. This is your GM. A lot of moving pieces. A lot of moving pieces. And we're, a lot of mouths to feed. Yeah. And our, our, our heads were spinning, you know. And at the time, we're like, oh, my God, like, what, are, what have we got into? And, you know, that, yeah. that kind of laid the, the groundwork to then, um, you know, understand to, to where we are now. Yeah. It's a little different than slinging drinks and counting money at the hundred <laughs> percent. A lot different. A lot of fires putting out. A lot of yeah. fires putting out. That's for sure. And um, you know the 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 really cool thing about after that that period with uh, Simple Play and Ron, I, I got the gig as I mentioned in Baton Rouge at the Varsity Theater. Mm-hmm. And the really cool thing about that was that was pure independent operation. There was two of us running the entire yeah. show. So we like had that's the, where we initially like really yeah yeah up. all yeah. the all those shows man yeah. And, um, coming through. yeah. And, 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 you know, it's like the, the general manager oversaw the bar operations and the op side of things. And then I had to book all the shows. I had to do all the marketing. I had to build all the ticketing. Um, so that, that was my like crash course in like every yeah. facet of running a venue, running a venue in side. the business and yeah. really, really understanding it. Cause prior to that, it was just like cut a deal, you know, rent a venue and yeah, they was, do all the it's work. It's different when you're kind of in house all the time and you have, Every problem is your problem. Yeah, basically. and early early mornings and late nights. You know? Yeah, and but that doesn't change ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay, so tell me about from the the jump from House of Blues eventually getting to where you are now at the Fillmore. Well, so um, after doing the varsity gig in Baton Rouge for uh, I think a year and a half or two years as their in house buyer, I got an opportunity to move back to New Orleans and bring the varsity with me and go under the Hookah Entertainment umbrella. Shout out to Dan Merker. Shout out Merker. Shout another, out another Island. legend. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we I, I continued to book the varsity there. I did, I did, I worked for them for a couple of years and then, um, really wanted to focus more on the management side of things. That was when I was still managing year yeah. funk and things were really starting to pick up with them. And so I, I left hookah and opened up my own shop with Austin Briggs and, um, we, you know, he was managing new master sounds and foundation of funk i was doing ear funk flow tribe uh the original meters reunion george porter's business That's good stable of artists yeah and then and still booking the uh the varsity and the soul kitchen and mobile at that point so yeah you're wearing you're doing the booking hat and also the managerial hat which is a lot yeah it's, it was, it's a lot of like bandwidth it, it literally especially I, you I, with new orleans artists yeah it, it was literally i i did not know how to not work all yeah. I did at that point was was work, 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 and you know, at, at that point, that's when you know partying started to become yeah. a bigger part of the equation because it was just 100 percent go all the time. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But then you eventually decided to step aside from management and focus solely on the booking. Yes. Yeah, so then, uh, after doing that for about a year and a half, I was approached by uh, Michael Yerke at Live Nation, um, who was interested in hiring me to book uh, House of Blues at that point and eventually booked the Fillmore that was in the process of being built. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it was always a dream of mine to sit in that chair and knowing, you know, Sonny has always been a legend. So I, I jumped at the opportunity and went over to the Live Nation side of things and never really looked back. It's awesome, man. It's, it's great to see someone, you know, I feel like any facet in the industry, I don't want to use the word stepping stones, but you gradually grow. And if you're you're totally prepared for what you're doing now because you'd find out in about six weeks if you could handle this and, yeah. live, and live nation would know oh, about yeah. six 100%, weeks because they're, they're in the business of like putting butts in seats. You yeah. Know, they're, they're not trying to do any favors. Or no. no. I don't think there's much nepotism going on in that company. No. You know, there, there is some, some you know, there is, a, we, we do pride in like, you know, the, the development, especially with the small rooms, but you know, we're not booking shows just to book cool shows. No, not at all. Especially in a post pandemic world. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the pandemic then a little bit. Yeah, that was and what, as a, cause I know from the artist perspective and artist business owner, what it was like, what was it like from your angle? It was the strangest, you know, I mean, yeah. just, I'm sure just the same as you, just yeah. very, very strange, a lot of fear. Um, one day everything was all good. The, the next day, you know, I remember March 14th, uh, 2020 is when everything shut down. I had a hippie sabotage show that was sold out at the Fillmore and uh, that got canceled and, you know, we had to figure out how to get them out. And then, you know, no one knew it was going to be what yeah. it was. It was like, oh, is this a week? Is this, you know, two weeks? And we kind of played that game at first. It was you know, pushing everything to May or beyond. And then as things really unveiled, it was, you it's know, like we don't fall maybe. Yeah. Fall maybe. And you know that we, we played that game for another year. Um, but yeah, it was like, I'd say three and a half months after the pandemic um, is, is just when I, I personally had a mental break where it's like, okay. I don't, I don't know how to function. I don't know how to do this. Like, you know, at that point um, I, I, all I knew how to do was work and, you know, produce concerts and yeah. it was all taken away yeah and it was just you know a, 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 a very isolating time and you know a lot of fear not knowing what 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 was going to happen yeah it's a lot to unpack because lo let's be honest most people their life everybody's lives were affected but most people didn't lose their livelihood or their passion yeah all at once and were you already sober at the time when this happened? Or is this no, like just, no, no. Yeah. This is this is like uh, I didn't get sober until three and a half months into the pandemic. Yeah, and, and but that's so, that's valiant, man. Yeah, I guess you you realize like for a lot of people there are two paths you could have gone down, and I like myself. But when I was looking at what's going to be the tail end of this thing, yeah, I realized this is an opportunity. This is a gift to make some changes. And I'm going to either be really happy with how this, how I treated with this time or not. And you, you seem to hit the ground running with it. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of was the, the perfect storm, you know, um, it, it really, it, it was, it was very eye opening that when the whole world stopped and all that, like with most people, you know, they, they stopped partying mm. and I, I didn't. And so for me that it was a, a very harsh reality of like, Hey, you have a problem and you need to do something about it. And, you know, I was very, very fortunate that, um, Live Nation was super supportive. They have a We Take Care of Our Own program. And oh, it's incredible. Yeah, I was able to, you know, make a phone call to HR, and a week later they, they sent me to a treatment center. And, incredible. You know, really, really supported me, um, you know, taking that time, especially when things were really slow, uh -huh. to, you know, get some sobriety under my belt and, you know, learn how to live. Exactly, yeah. And just coming from a person in an industry where you said all you knew how to do was work, and then when the work goes away – what's the only thing that you have left? Yeah. And that, that was like me too, where when we would tour heavily, I would, especially when I didn't have to barge anymore, I would come back home and it'd be like, everybody's working. What am I, what am I going to do right now? And the one commonality I had between the road and home was I could party. That was the only thing that was like the yeah. only normal C I had. And then you don't realize until you get caught up in these kind of scenarios. And, but you're doing fantastic now, right? Oh, it's, I mean, look, I'm, I'm happier than I've ever been. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, I have a newfound love and respect for, you know, what, what we do. Uh -huh. And, you know, just the, the, it's something I'll never take for granted again. You know, I, I felt like prior to the pandemic, it was, you, you know, we're, we're in that nonstop turnover yeah. where, where it's like, oh, I'm sick of this. Or like, oh, I wish I didn't have to do this. And now it's like, you know, even if it's a show that I'm not a fan of musically, like just to see people come together again and have those experiences is absolutely that's what keeps me going. So, 
you're you're sober, you work in the industry, and you live in New Orleans. How how do you navigate that? Well, so man, it, what's what's you know what what I've I've come to realize um, since I've I've been doing this thing is. When you go to these party towns like New Orleans, like a Vegas, because they're such big party towns, they have a great, great recovery. And, you know, what's really cool about New Orleans is, you know, as you know, there's a lot of musicians who are sober. Um, yeah. There, there's a, a lot. Some have it publicly known. Yeah. And, and some are more private about yeah. it. And, you know, it, it they, they kind of some of those guys reached out to me and just, you know. Nice. To show me that, hey, you know. We're here. We got. We're you. here. We got you. When you're ready. Yeah, and there's here. and there's a way to do this. Yeah. Um. And you know, just seeing those guys was like, okay, like if, if that person can play, you know, 19 shows in seven days during Jazz Fest and yeah. stay sober, like then I can clearly, you know, produce a hang. couple of concerts yeah. and hang. I can do this. And thing. and you know, it was like trying to figure out what that looked like. Which for me, it's like, you know, I, I go to a show, I, I I hang out with you guys after, like mm-hmm. we did on Friday night, and then like I go home and go to bed. Yeah. Like, I, I don't need to go to a Snake and Jake's until four in the yeah. morning to go hang with people. The it's FOMO, like, it's the FOMO. Yeah. I, I guess it's the first hurdle of sobriety. It's you're spending this time doing all these different things with people, and I don't want to say when you take a step back. I think initially in that phase you feel bored, but now it's the simplicity that I long for where like the me five years ago would be out every single night till 9 a.m and yeah. now like i'm totally cool with leaving the show saying my goodbyes to everybody and going home yeah and i mean instead I, of searching for something and, and totally and that's like you know that's the thing it's like prior to getting sober it's like you know i was always i was always seeking connection of some sort yeah you know whether it was the hang afterwards or the show like it was always just had yeah, to be something it was a hustle there was yeah. like if and I, I'll be the first one to admit it. There are so many gigs and relationships I've made with people by hanging and going to places late night and just like being there. And that was a scary thing for me is like, if I stop doing that, am I just going to fall off the face of the earth? Am I not going to have opportunities come my way? But then you realize like, that's totally not the case. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and, and you know, also like I had this fear that like, Oh, what are people going to think? And like yeah. people respect it. Like, like, Oh, Hey, like, you know, he yeah. learned how to take care of himself. Exactly. And, yeah. and for me, it was like, once I, I, I really learned how to like, like and love myself as is mm-hmm. then integrating back into that situation. I, I, you know, I, I go to my job, I perform my job, I, I hang with you guys, I hang with whoever, you know, mm-hmm. spend time with people, and then like I go home and go to bed and just start the next day. And it's a simple life, but it's yeah, a good life. Yeah, it's very simple and it's awesome, man. It's, it's, uh, it's incredible to have, you know, but what people don't understand is it's not normal. Yeah. And that's okay. Like I straddled that line of what what is normal in this, and it's it's not traditional. But I think which allows you to get yourself into some of these ruts and holes and you, you find yourself caught up in some stuff you don't want to. But because we're in an, a, it's a fun job, it can be fun and exciting. It's nice to be able to just go home and, and chill. And it's not like some people can't do that. They get home and they're like, I don't want to be here. And it's like, no, I, I enjoy my solitude. now. Yeah. And not only that, but like, you know, it, it's before it's like if, you know, while it was my job, it was like, that was my life. Like that was, yeah, yeah. yeah. And now it's like, I, I have a job, I go to work and I'm able to, you know, ha- have a, 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 what is like a, a normal life yeah. <laughs> to a normal person. It's like finally figuring that out in your thirties. You yeah. Know? It's not your work life. Isn't always bleeding through into your home. Life. Exactly. Yeah. But speaking of work life, we're, we're in the thick of jazz fest, man. I think you have some really cool programming coming up this second week if you want to talk about it. Yeah, so um, Thursday night at the Orpheum, we have Carl Denson doing an Amy Winehouse tribute with uh, Danielle Ponder. He's going to be performing Amy's parts, and Genesis Owusu is opening up. Super cool. If you don't know Genesis, I've been hearing him a lot on the XM station. He's just He's got a cool vibe. Yeah, yeah. He's a British guy, right? Yep, and so I'm super excited for that. And then – Friday night at the Orpheum, we have Government Mule, uh, which nice. is always Shout a great out to show. Warren. George Porter Jr. and Running Partners are going to open up, so it's going to be a solid a night, bill. night full of legends. And then Thursday through Saturday, we have three nights of Joe Russo's Almost Dead at the Fillmore. That yeah. So this second weekend, what's interesting about this particular Jazz Fest is Dead and Co. is finally playing. I know they were slated for the pandemic to yep. come in, and Daniel and I were just talking about how the entire like 
not just gig economy, the like tornado that comes to town when the dead do something. And Joe Russo being, you know, like a disciple of that music playing and further everything is part of that. But J-Rad has taken on this incredible life of its own where you essentially have a cover band that is selling out arenas and doing multiple night runs all over the country. Yeah, and it's, it's almost exploded. like the Fillmore is like an underplay. It 100% for them, is an underplay. Which is insane to think about where you have a band that's actually playing the fairgrounds just brings this whole circus with them throughout the entire week because they're not all here yet, but come Thursday, oh, like yeah. they're going to show up for, for wherever they come from. For it's sure. incredible. Yeah, it really is. And just seeing, you know, how, the, how that band took off. And I mean, shout out... Peter Costello, their manager, and uh, you know Aaron Pincus, who books them, they they really, really ran it the right way, yeah. and you know developed it the right way, to where it's you know it, it's not like you're just here. It's not like a tribute band where you're gonna hear the no, same show. It's no, like no, 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 every no. night is different, and and it it really pays homage to you know prime prime time dead. Any person I know that's actually had the opportunity to see the Grateful Dead as really loves J Rad. They love the spin they're putting on it. And let's be honest, the musicians that are incredible. In here just not only are they incredible, but together collectively it's just magic can happen every night. And it's great to think that we said these dudes sell out multiple nights at Red Rocks. Yeah. You know what I and mean? I mean do they're there's they're you know top line, top two lines at festivals. Yeah, they're so. they're no joke. Yeah. And they're a bunch of nice guys in the band. Very too, nice for guys. Sure. But uh it's this whole week is different because normally, you know, you have huge artists come and play jazz fest all the time, but the only other band I can think that like comes into a town and takes over the town is like the stones. Like there's not yeah. many artists like sure. Like Taylor Swift can come in, but like, it's almost like cultural movements. The dead are like that. The stones are like fish. That. Fish, fish is totally yeah, like that. Here, that was you a... can tell when those people are just in the town, the music is played everywhere. It's almost like a family reunion for everybody. Oh yeah. It's a, on top it's of a, just being jazz fest. It's a legitimate, you know, takeover and, and yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's great to see. And, you know, I, I think, you know, Quentin, the jazz fest guys have realized, you know, having those people in town is great for everyone. Absolutely. What, what are you excited about seeing yourself? Uh, so I'm look. I'm excited to check out all the shows I just mentioned. Yep. Um, I'm excited to go and see Santana on Thursday at the local Thursday. I will be there as well. Yeah, I'm really uh, really pumped for that. And if I recall correctly, Buddy Guy is playing before. He's on his damn right farewell tour, which kicked off in Baton Rouge with us, and the show was incredible. Awesome. So uh, you know, I definitely want to go and, and see him again. And let's see what else. Dead and Co. I'm definitely excited for. I think I'm going to go Thursday, Saturday. And then uh, Sunday, Mumford and Sons into Troy is yeah you know, can't be missed. For those that don't know, uh, Trombone Shorty Troy Andrews has become the official farewell set of uh, Jazz Fest. Yep. So I've been able to see him in some incredible situations, whether who it's the Foo Fighters before him or the Neville Brothers, which I guess originally would that was yeah that was slot. their slot yeah. And he's just like become such an ambassador for the, like him, John Batiste. It's just great to see these people have this like national spotlight and yeah, and like that. Man, I got I got to give Troy and his whole team a shout out, David and Matt. You know, we 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 uh we had the Treme Throwdown with them on Saturday yeah. night at the Sanger, and man, it's like every year they just step up their special guests to another yeah, level. Yeah, it's a who's who of A-list. Yeah, and you know, uh, Saturday night we have. Corey Wong, uh, Robert Glasper, Eric Church, Mavis Staples. Uh, Steve, Such an eclectic group. Yeah, Steve Miller. Um, I don't want to forget anybody. Taj Mahal, uh, Yola. I mean, it was just top to bottom. It's just an all-star That's performance. Cool. And it, it's, you know, seeing Troy not only command that, but people respect him and respect what he's doing for New Orleans to come oh, yeah. and want to be a part of that is just so cool, man. Yeah, it's, we're lucky to have somebody. And he's he's been doing it for a long time. Yeah, that was his. That, uh, just a specifically, long time. that show was his seventh Tremé throwdown. But I mean, dude, he's been in the game since you know he was thirteen dude, or fourteen. I remember being like a sophomore or junior at Loyola, and like they were doing like homegrown nights at Tipitina's, and he was playing on like a Wednesday. But back then, like Joey, 
Pete, all these dudes, Dan, were in the band then. Yeah. And the fact that they've stayed together as a unit is a testament to Troy and the music and what they're doing. And now they play all over the world. All over. And this is his town. This is his time. And that's why you can get, you know, Eric Church. Yeah. Steve Miller. They want to be a part of that. They want to come to town and, and be a part of what's going on. Because let's be honest, man. We have two times. How many cities you know out there that have two times where the eyes of the world are upon us? We have Mardi Gras, which is... A drinking fest with music oh, yeah. and we have jazz fest which is a music fest with drinking. drinking yeah no 100 percent, man and uh you know the the guy the show you guys put on on friday night was also incredible as always yeah man we've been very lucky to kind of uh have you guys as a home at the fillmore and it's just it's a fantastic room man like if there's not a bad viewpoint the sound is great and if you want you can go after hits the craft staples there you go man. yeah so <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> but yeah, man. Um, but yeah, what I just want to know what what do you have going on this summer? What are you excited about? What uh, what am I excited yeah. about, man? So uh, you know, normally summers are pretty slow um, in New Orleans in the club and theater world, just because of all the festivals and stuff going on. But we have uh, Fleet Foxes at the end of Very June, cool. which I'm excited about. Um, we have Pixies and Franz Ferdinand the cool week bill. before that in June, which is going to be really cool. Um, you know, in the arena world, the Wednesday after Jazz Fest, we have The Cure. Um, oh, yeah, they're on their big tour Yeah, right they're now. kicking off their tour here. And then the next night, we have the Tenacious D's coming back to the Fillmore. So, always love those guys. I, the last show there was apparently legendary, man. It, I, it, heard, I, I know a lot of serious music fans that went to that show just to see it. And they're like, dude, that was one of the best sets I've seen in years. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. an incredible show, dude. And, and, and it's like... It's one of those things where the people that get it really get it. And just um, seeing, you know, how their business has grown. I mean, again, this is the smallest run they're playing on this entire yeah, tour. Which is awesome that it, it happens in town in New Orleans in such a great spot. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, excited for that. Um, what else do we have coming up? Do we, we have a Duran Duran, Nile Rodgers and Sheik show at the, at the arena in awesome. June, which is going to be a cool one. Um, Shania Twain in July. Alicia Keys in July. Uh, Snoop Dogg and Wiz Khalifa in August, which will be really cool. Sounds like you're gonna be busy. You gonna have yeah. any time to, for yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm actually after the the day after the Tenacious D's show. Uh, my partner Adrian and I we are flying to the Bahamas to have a little decompression nice. session. And um, yeah, you know, other than that, just just rock and roll and gearing up for a big fall. Awesome, man. I want Hopefully, gonna come you. see you guys at a couple festivals this summer. Come, yeah, of course, you can be my plus one whenever you want. My Let's man. go, but man! Yeah, thanks for doing this. I appreciate. Thank it. Thank you for having me, everybody. Appreciate it, bud. Cool.